Yeah, Rohini, I think we'll start and uh, you know, probably have the others uh, join us later. Okay. Sure. Sure. No Uh, so, uh, webinars uh, which aim to uh, we have uh, organizing this uh, seminars as part of, uh, in with uh, us so angel but we have uh, Rohini Nair uh, she is one of the founding uh, members of uh, mid size law firm called NB Legal. Uh, she's a commerce graduate and holds an LLB degree from the prestigious government law college, Mumbai. Uh, she has been instrumental in uplifting uh, of the, uh, the company's credentials and establishments uh, of the firm uh, across uh, various branches in India, including Mumbai, Delhi, Goa, etc. Uh, she, along with her team, deals with matters of corporate restructuring, uh, mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, private equity, and several corporate commercial transactions, including licensing and transfer of technology across uh, various uh, sectors. Uh, she's been advising clients on strategies uh, for structuring transactions, conducting due diligence exercises, and drafting and negotiating of uh, transaction uh, documents. In today's session, she'll uh, brief us about uh, on uh, IP protection and uh, trademark protection primarily. Uh, over to you, Rohini. Thank you, Nirmal. Thank you for having on board. And uh, while I'll admit it's not very interesting a subject, it's a little dry to be very honest. But I think it's uh, you no know, intellectual property uh, in itself has a value which you know, and for the organization, it is very important to protect the intellectual property uh, rights around the product, the service they, that they develop. My present Yes, perfect. Okay. So good evening, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to the session on. Sorry. Yeah. Welcome to the session on uh, protection of intellectual property rights in India. The whole uh, idea today is to. Uh, sorry. Maybe you can drag down to it. That would be better. It's only my PDF file which is visible, right? That's right, the PDF file. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. So what is intellectual property rights. How important is it for your organization is something that uh, is one of the very important thing that I want to discuss today. Regardless of whether you intend to go bootstrap or you are uh, thinking of getting third party funds to run your operations, doesn't matter. Okay, we're gonna discuss that. So you say intellectual property in itself is an asset. I'm sure you're aware of it. It's an intangible asset of an organization and uh, it's got a value in itself. Every startup, so every startup, every organization of, of at any level, you know, it's got a trade name, brand, logo, advertisements, tagline, designs. If it's a manufacturing uh, unit, then it would have its own uh, processes, technology that they may have developed. 
or uh, or a product a saas product for all you know depending on the sector that you're in right in order to create an identity in itself to sustain in the market it becomes imperative to secure the intellectual property rights around such brand logo your uh, your your product your services that you're rendering so each one of you would have a product or a service that you're into it it depends right but the intellectual property is it has to be valued and needs to be protected now if you talk on the there are three four ways uh three four categories in which the ip could be uh, divided one is the trademark where you know you want to create a brand value you want to create recognition that's true trademark a copyright is if you have an artistic work there is a literature that you that one has created one has developed then that needs to be protected under the copyright uh that fall under the copyright uh, uh, regulations then if you have any process technology that you've developed then yes that needs to be patented these are the major three heads under which your ip would fall then you have of course designs as well which is a different thing altogether but but these are the major three heads that i am talking about here more often than not people uh, uh, you know uh, misinterpret as to where will the brand name fall you know they try and see to it if they falls in the copyright but no it's not copyright it's actually trademark so you need to at least have a basic knowledge of the ba the main heads of uh, intellectual property only then you will be able to carry out the necessary acts so as to protect to as to register your ip under the particular regulation and take necessary steps to uh, protect the ip around it right so what i'm trying to say is you as an organization should be proactive in developing and protecting your intellectual property around your product around your services for many reasons i'll tell you some of them one is that it improves the valuation of your company i'll give you an example okay uh one of the startups that uh, uh, that was getting funded in the uh, in the agri tech space if i'm not mistaken uh no we were for the investors and these guys had not made an application to register their their brand name their logo and uh, when our when our client investor wanted to make an investment into them uh they they said you know what one of the conditions precedent to the transaction is that you will have to file your uh, trademark applications and this was in the nascent stage when they were in discussions and they filed it uh, once the term sheet was signed because they want the minimum commitment and they got that the diligence process happened all of that happened it took a very long time by then uh, uh, you know they realized that the registrar had 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 raised a concern on the application because there was something which was similar to what they were intending to uh, you know recognize as a trademark of their own proprietary to them so you see the investor it didn't really give a good taste with the investor and hence they had to compromise on the valuation of the company now you don't really want to go that path and hence it is very essential once you have set up your entity once your business is up and running and you are out there in the market to pro to promote to market to sell distribute your product your services my advice to you is that it may be a little expensive yes i understand that you know everything costs today right so everything comes at a price but it is very essential for you to to take the necessary steps to register your your trademark uh you know your logo the brand name whatever that you're using because that really has has a positive impact on the valuation of your company that is one two is that obviously it generates a better goodwill for your company in the longer run third is that it gives you a, a competitive advantage in the market and hence it helps you generate more revenue there are chances that you probably generate more revenue because you have a registered mark right and of course it gives you a marketing edge and yes in case uh, you know anybody else happens to use 
a mark which is similar to yours, then you certainly have protection against any infringement claims that uh, infringement from any third party, right? Because you have the appropriate, since you are the registered owner to that mark, what happens is you are protected and in case somebody else uses it, you have the right to, uh, uh, to make a claim against that particular party. So that's exactly why uh, you know, we all should understand the importance of intellectual property rights. Moving on, the first head that I mentioned, trademark. Now, trademark is governed by the Trademarks Act 1999. The rules were recently amended uh, in 2017. Okay, so what is a trademark? Let's understand that first before uh, we, we get into the details. What I'm going to do is that I'm not going to bombard you with uh, all the regulations because that would uh, really not help. But I would probably give you some examples, some practical aspects that you need to keep in mind when you look at uh, a trademark, right? So going to the basic definition of uh, trademark under the Trademark Act 1999, it is any mark, symbol, a logo or a slogan, a product packaging or design that identifies the goods or services from a particular source. So if you go by the definition of trademark, it means any mark which is capable of being represented geographically and capable of distinguishing the goods or services of one person from those of the other. Okay, that's a simple definition of trademark. So it helps you distinguish yourself from the products of another competitor of yours, if at all, right? So hence, it is very important to understand the concept of a mark and have it appropriately registered with the trademark registry. Now, any entity needs to be cautious in selecting its brand name logo. So that's exactly why at a very nascent stage, you should identify the mark and try and see if you're not really using something which is already there in the market. Because if at all you do, and if they are already, uh, they've already registered their mark, then, you know, there could be, and you could be slapped with an infringement claim, you know, for all you know. So that's not something you really want on your table. And hence, at a very early stage, you should seek help and try and see to it that the, that, that whatever mark that you're using to represent your represent the goods and products, the goods and services that you are marketing and selling is something which is unique to you and it's not something to market. Okay. So appropriate diligence is something which needs to be carried out. The other thing which you should obviously keep in mind is that you should not be using a generic word when you want to create a, 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 a trademark for your, uh, for your organization because that's not going to be passed. Because even when you make an application to the registry, they're not going to accept it. Hence, it's important for you to ensure that you're not using a generic word. Right? For example, uh, I'll give you an example. There was this uh, judgment uh, in a case where uh, it was uh, between Big Three Entertainment Private Limited versus uh, uh, D. Sharma and others. The plaintiff objected to the utilization of the trademark book my event, which was being used by another party. So the court held that the word book my are very generic in nature and extremely normal in English language. Uh, and therefore, it's, you know, they said, like, it's it cannot be considered uh, as exclusive to the plaintiff. So let's test it on Indians. Logic is there. I mean, we are, you know, you see the logic. But one big miss was that, uh, and they've spoken very candidly about this. One big miss is that Indians students, uh, can you look Indians into this? Indians students in the US had running water. Everything else was fine. But the running water was like one of those things that kind of changed the whole uh, you know, uh, change the whole usage of the product because basically, you know, the unclogging of the razor wasn't as simple as they thought. So it's, it's fascinating, right? Like, it's like you have all the, the Gillette, like you have all the insights, all the resources, 
Thank you, Nimal. Whatever worked. Um, yes, so um, I was talking about the judgment. So a generic word is not something that you can use. So just be mindful of that when you actually use uh, or think of a, a mark for your, uh, for your brand, right? In India, uh, you know, we follow the NICE classification of goods and services for the purpose of uh, identifying and registering the trademark. So in case you have a, a, a brand name or a logo, depending on the kind of the nature of product that you're selling or marketing that you're into, uh, depending on the nature of services that uh, you are into, you have to, uh, you know, you have to seek help in identifying which class do you belong to. So there are there are 45 classes available, okay? And one to 34 classes are, are only for goods, okay? So it's it's depending on the kind of goods you are, that you are selling or promoting, you have to identify the class. As against services, you have classes 35 to 45 uh, within which you have to identify the services that you are entering. And, 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 and identify the class. For example, if you're in the entertainment industry, you're looking at class 41 because entertainment falls under class 41. If you are into any consulting services, then you are in uh, class 35. In, in, in case you're looking at any kind of legal services, then it's uh, class 45. So, you know, depending on the kind of services that you're into, you have to identify the class and that's the class under which you have to make an application, right? So NICE classification, which is uh, acceptable in India, which India follows, is also recognized by majority of the countries. And hence, it's internationally accepted. However, in some countries, if you really want to file, then you have to make a different application and you need to go under various protocols to be able to make an application there. Okay. So from... A trademark perspective, trademark undoubtedly is a, plays a very significant role in, uh, in your business. So whenever you're doing business or thinking about starting a company, the first thing you got to do is to get the, the, the mark, the brand name registered in order to secure the trademark and maintain the quality of the product. Because see, if your product is doing really well in the market and, and people have recognized it, but what if one day somebody, some third party comes and says, you know, you, you can't use this brand because it belongs to me. It's similar to what I am into and you, I know it's similar to my mark and you can't use it. Imagine at that point in time for you to really change your brand name would be very difficult. You either fight it out and push back or you change, you know, so, it, so at later stages, you may just fall in trouble and hence it's important to take uh, proactive steps in this space. The other concept that uh, I find it important for you to uh, understand in this bit is about infringement and uh, uh, concept of passing off. Now in the course of using a mark, okay, it is said to be infringing the rights of that other company due to use of an identical or similar or deceptively similar mark for marketing alike goods and services. That could be infringement. I used this terminology earlier, but I'm just taking this up right now. Okay, so infringement claims are something which you should be careful of if you haven't registered your, your, your mark or you know, if you haven't copyrighted it or if you're not painted, patented it. The other thing is passing off. Now, while the Trademark Act doesn't really explicitly have a provision for passing off, unlike the infringement provision that specifically describes passing off, but there are a number of common law judgments that let the courts draw its meaning as to whether the infringement of a trademark done is in such a way that the mark is not only deceptively similar, to the trademark of the other company, but it is also capable of creating or is creating a confusion in the minds of the consumer. 
in which case it is it is it, it is uh, it's a passing off claim okay now let's understand uh, i know the differentiation between infringement and passing off now infringement a type of remedy in case if at all you want to make an infringement claim so the remedy, the remedy that you have as a registered owner to a mark is the statutory remedy under the trademark act 1999 as against if it's a passing off claim then it's a common law remedy that you have as far as registration is concerned so in simple words here the trademark has been registered by the owner and the infringement happens then it becomes a suit for infringement but if the mark has not been registered by the owner and an infringement happens then the owner has to make a uh, passing off claims it cannot go under the infringement it cannot file an infringement suit because the owner's uh, mark itself is not registered so that is the basic difference between an infringement claim and a passing off claim an infringement claim can only be made by a person whose mark already is registered and the other person is using a similar mark as against the passing off claim the owner has the owner himself or herself has not really registered the mark but find something which is similar in the market and ends and that product whatever is being sold <coughs> creates a confusion in the mind of the consumers and hence you make a passing off claim as far as jurisdiction is concerned you know uh, how where do you file it under what do you file it so the registered user of the mark can initiate the suit where it actually and what where where they actually uh, and voluntarily reside or carry on the business or 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 actually where uh, the, the the user is a uh, user's registered business is as against a uh, passing off claim it is as per section 20 of the cpc the civil procedure code 1908 that will apply so in case of any infringement or passing off claims the relief that the court may grant in a suit for infringement or passing off includes a permanent or an interim injunction it could either be damages or accounts for profits it could be delivery of the infringing goods for destruction or the cost for legal proceedings so it really is at the discretion of the court but in case you do file any claim under these two heads then you can expect the court you can you can seek in your prayers that you you want these uh, these to uh, you know these to be uh, granted to you and of course the court at its discretion will grant it to you uh, you know uh, basis the the merits in the case also uh, one thing to note is that in case of an infringement uh, claim it's also a cognizable offense and criminal proceedings can also be initiated against the infringer here i would like to take you to a, a judgment which was uh, you know rolex versus alex jewelry here the plaintiff filed a case against the def defendant who was dealing in an artificial jewelry and using the trademark rolex associated with the plaintiff i know and you would know who i'm talking about the honorable court held that the plaintiff's trademark was a very well known trademark since the general public using watches recognized the trade name rolex and hence the defendant using the same name for dealing with artificial jewelry certainly created a confusion in the minds of general public and might create an assumption that the products are those of the plaintiff company hence the court granted an injunction against the trade name rolex which was being used by the defendant so this is what i'm talking about okay the other concept in the trademark space that i want to take you through is the concept of prior usage rights now what happens if you apply for a trademark application and get the trademark registered but later that someone has been later you find out that someone else has been using the same mark since before before you filed it even before you filed the application now here the concept of prior usage rights comes in the principle is 
priority in adoption and use prevails over priority in registration. Now that holds good in this case. It's a well established judicial principle that the rights of a prior user of mark are kept at a higher pedestal over the proprietor of a registered trademark. Remember this, even if you've registered your mark, you have to remember, keep, bear this in mind. And hence you need to do appropriate due diligence to ensure that you're not really uh, you know, uh, applying for registering a mark which is already there in the market or somebody else is already using it. So prior users' right will override those of a subsequent user even though the subsequent user has been accorded registration by the registry. So when I say prior use, it's not a very uh, uh, loosely termed word, but there are various judgments which have uh, indicated the fundamental principles, the elements which are required to acknowledge the prior use, the claim of a prior use. What are those? There are four of them. One is the use of the mark identical or nearly resembling the registered mark by a third person must be in relation to the goods and services for which the first mentioned mark has already been registered. Okay. Second is the use must be a continuous one in India. So it cannot be, uh, 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 you know, it cannot be just in parts or occasionally being used. No, it must be a continuous use of the trademark in India. Third is the trademark must be used by the proprietor in order to avail the protection under prior usage principle. The fourth being that the mark must have been from a date prior to the use of the registered trademark or the date of registration, whichever is earlier. So it should have been used before the, before the, app, before the application for the, uh, uh, the, the, the mark has already been uh, accepted and registered, okay? So all these four elements put together forms the principle of prior usage. And if at all the prior usage, if at all these four elements are duly fulfilled, then yes, uh, one can claim right under the principle of prior usage. Taking you to one of the most uh, recent amendments, which I mentioned uh, uh, no, uh, some time back about the trademark rules 2017. There were a couple of uh, amendments which were carried out. While I won't really take you through all of them, but a, but a few of them which I think I should bring to your attention is that the process of, uh, of filing and getting a trademark registered uh, was fairly simpl uh, simplified. The number of forms which are to be filed were reduced. Okay, there was reduction in fees, which you can notice. Also, in order to promote e-filings, there was a 10% discount on the government fee, which has been uh, notified. Uh, so whatever fee, uh, government fee that you pay, is a 10% discount in case you're filing it online. Then is a number of adjournments. Adjournments in an opposition proceeding has been restricted to maximum two by each party. So but this really helps uh, timely disposal of matters. The other bit is uh, you know, application for renewal of registration of a trademark can be filed within one year from the expiration of the registration of the trademark. That's a good thing again. So that's my take on uh, trademark and the elements around it. The second bit that I want to discuss today is about uh, copyright. In case you have any questions, uh, uh, feel free to ask me once uh, you know, I have dealt with the entire session. I'm happy to take it up at the end of the session, right? Copyright. Now, copyright is governed by uh, the, uh, the Copyright Act 1957. And it's also got its rules, the copyright rules 1958. Now this is what uh, governs uh, the copyright protection in India. There were substantial amendments uh, which were made in the Copyright Act 2012. Now, just to give an additional information, uh, you know, India is also a member of the Berne Convention and Universal Copyright Convention. 
So the government of India has also passed an international copy, copyright order, 1999. And according to this order, any work first published in any country that is a member to any of these conventions that I just mentioned, the Bern Convention or the Universal Copyright Convention, will be granted the same treatment as if it was first published in India. Now, that's something which the government of India had to work for under the International Copyright Order 1999. Okay. So let's understand what is the kind of work that we can, uh, uh, that one can uh, protect, that one can register under the Copyright uh, Act. The Copyright Right, subsists throughout India under the following classes. The classes being original literature, dramatic, musical, and artistic work. That's one head. The second being cinematographic films, sound recording. So these are the major broad categories under which copyright can be uh, uh, categorized. Now, any kind of content that you develop, any kind of literature that you come up with. For example, you have a website and you come up with some brochure uh, content. Now that falls in the first head, okay? In case you create any kind of uh, music, then music, uh, any kind of poem that, that goes under the, the first category of musical work, okay? So let's understand what is required for any work to qualify for copyright protection. Now, any work which falls under any of the categories that I just mentioned is qual uh, qualifies to be protected under Copyright Act. The work which is to be copyrighted must be original. However, it is not necessary that the work should have some original uh, thought or idea in it. So the work in itself should be original. Quality does not matter. So it just needs to be original. The law is only concerned about the originality of the expression or the thought. So what right does a copyright grant to the right holder? A copyright grants protection to the creator, okay, by way of an agreement for the work and prevents such work from being copied or reproduced without their consent. What's the duration for which a copyright can be protected? It's uh, generally 60 years from the date of in the date uh, on which the work is published. However, for any kind of literary, dramatic, musical, or an artistic work, the duration is, it expires 60 years from the end of the calendar in which the author dies. So there's a difference in the duration, okay? Now, to understand who is the first owner of a copyright work, Again, it's a very important aspect because if you have had somebody in your organization, if you, if you hired somebody in your organization to carry out some kind of uh, you know, literary work and to draw up something for you, which is original, then you need to understand it goes under the bucket of works for hire. While I just mentioned that whoever creates the work is the owner. However, it is very important to note if any work has been done during the course of the employment, it's called works for hire because they have been employed to do so. And hence the employer becomes the owner to that particular work. So like as a general principle, copyright to any work rest in the person who's created such work. However, in case of a work made during the course of an employment or under a contract or an arrangement, then the employer in the absence of a contract, the contrary will be the first owner of copyright. Remember this. Hence, if you are an employer, you need to remember that you need to have a works for hire clause in your employment agreement, which you hand out to your employee. It's very important. I have more often than not seen, more often than not seen that this provision doesn't really come in in the employment letter, which is not really good for the organization. Because if not for that, then you'll have to get an assignment uh, agreement done. Get uh, a works for hire provision really works best for the organization because you don't really know during the course of employment what all do they develop. You don't really want them to have a right over it. And hence, it's important for you to have a works for hire clause in your employment contract, which you execute with your employees. And even in a, in a consulting agreement, you have that. So you should always ensure it's always there in a contract, right? Then 
can you register a copyright? That's the next question. Trademark, we discussed that it's important to register your mark, your brand name, your logo, whatever it is under the trademark, right? To recognize the brand, okay? To get some recognition in the market. What about copyright? Is it really important? Is it really compulsory to register your, cop your, your work under the Copyright Act? And what are the benefits that such registration would give you and what other steps, if any, can you take? If at all, there are any infringement claims that come in. So under Indian law, registration, copyright registration is not a prerequisite for acquiring a copyright in a work. This is very important to understand because I've always seen mostly clients coming to me and saying, you know, they want to actually uh, uh, copyright their software, copyright the content on their platform. Well, that's not necessary because if it is an original content that you've developed and put up on your platform, then it is yours. It has to be original. Like I said, that's a very basic and fundamental element for you to call that work uh, uh, proprietary to you. Okay. So if at all you've developed and it's original, then you don't necessarily need to register it under the Copyright Act. You're anyways the owner to that the author, the owner to that particular work, okay? So a copyright in a work is created when the work is created and given a material form, provided it's original, like, like we just discussed. However, the act provides a procedure for copyright registration. It does provide for a registration, but it's up to you whether you really want to incur that cost and carry out the copyright registration. Such registration does not count for any special rights, like I just mentioned, right? with respect to the registered copyright uh, work. It is however suggested that the owner may consider registering it so that you get a certificate of registration of copyright. But again, you are anyways the owner. So it's up to you whether you want to uh, make that expenditure to register your copy, uh, register your work under the Copyright Act. That's, uh, that's a bit about uh, Copyright Act. Then is about uh, patents. Now, patents is a very, very uh, 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 comprehensive uh, statute and uh, very technical. However, I will try my best to keep it as simple as possible so that it's easier for uh, you know for you as participants uh, to understand. And obviously, because of paucity of time, we really cannot get into the depth of it. So we'll try and keep it as brief as possible on the patents bit as well. Now, patents, of course, is governed by the Patents Act 1970. Okay, now patents in general means is a monopoly given to an inventor on his inventions to commercialize that invention in the market. Okay, for a certain period, of course. So what's invention uh, include? So under Section 21J of the Patents Act, Inventions includes any new and useful art, processes, methods, or manner of manufacture. It includes machines, apparatus, or other article. It includes substance produced by a manufacturer and includes any new and useful improvement of any of them and an alleged invention. Remember that invention, yes, can be patented, but an uh, an idea cannot be okay so if you have a business idea it cannot be patented and that idea has to convert into some work either you have to develop something which can be patented or it could be copyrighted so it's important for you to understand that an idea cannot be patented there could not be anything done as far as an idea you can't protect an idea okay so the definition of the word invention includes the new product as well as the new process. Therefore, a patent can be filed for the product as well as processes which is new, involving uh, inventorship and capable of uh, industrial application. And, and, and if these three factors are taken into consideration and they fulfill these, two, these three requirements, then yes, you can patent that particular invention in India. However, before one files an application uh, for grant of patent in India, it's important to note what is not patentable in India, okay? So according to chapter two 
of uh, uh, the Patent Act 1970, uh, there are certain inventions which cannot be patented. One is which is frivolous, which is obvious, contrary to the well-established natural laws, which is contrary to, uh, to, to any other law, morality, injurious to public health, which is very important. A mere discovery of a scientific principle cannot be patented. An invention which is mere discovery of a new property or a new use for a known substance or process cannot be patented. So these are some of uh, the basic things that cannot be, these are inventions, yes, these may fall within the ambit of the definition of invention. However, these cannot be patented under the Patent Act 1970. Now, infringement of a patent consists of authorized, unauthorized making, importing, using, offering for sale or selling any patented invention within India. Now, these can be considered as infringement of a, of, of a registered patent. Under the Patent Act, only a civil action can be initiated under court of law. And the relief which a court may usually grant is a suit for infringement of patent includes permanent and interim injunction, damages or account of profits, uh, cost for the legal proceedings, like the way we mentioned earlier. So that's 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 at the discretion of the court, of course. But yes, these are a few things that you can pray for in case uh, you do file an infringement uh, claim. Uh, you, you do carry out uh, proceedings for uh, infringement. It is pertinent to note that uh, uh, the patent infringement proceedings can only be initiated after the grant of patent in India. Now, as far as startups and MSMEs are concerned, more often than not, these patents are not really applied for or it's applied for but not granted because it takes a while for it to get uh, granted and also it's 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 a little expensive as well however you what you can do is you can you can you can do a search in the market to see if there are no similar technologies in the market that's something that you can probably do uh, on the side before you really pitch uh, to the investors for funding right and the other bit uh, which i think uh, you know, uh, which I could probably take up after my last uh, 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 slide is, okay, the so industrial designs, like I mentioned, uh, it's again, uh, excuse the, 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 the typo on designs. <laughs> okay, uh, so as per the definition given under 2D of the Design Act 2000, design means only the feature of a shape, a configuration, a pattern, ornament or composition of lines or colors applied to any article. Now that's uh, in any dimension. Now that's called a design, okay? Now it does not include any mode or principle of construction or anything which is in substance a mere mechanical device and does not include any trademark, okay? So the owner of a registered design right, may exclusively work on a registered design or any design similar to. If a third party manufactures or sells the registered design or any similar design for commercial purposes, and if the third party has, has not licensed to do so by the owner of the registered design, right, such activity constitutes a, a, a design right infringement. This is something which is very important to understand and uh, more often than not, you know, people tend to ignore this aspect of IP. The scope of design right extends to not only the registered design, but to any similar design. The similarity of design is an issue for determination of design infringement. Okay. Now, what are the, like we, like we discussed as to what are the essential requirements for a particular work to qualify as uh, copyright, which is only has to be original, right? One of the essential requirements for any design for protection under, uh, for protection from design infringement in India is design should be original or new, like, like the copyright work, right? The other is the design should not have been previously disclosed to the public. A design should be significantly distinguished from other known designs or combinations. So these three elements need to be kept in mind in case you are looking at protection from any design infringement. 
the total period of validity of registration uh, under the Design Act is 15 years flat. The, the Design Act 2000 only provides for civil remedies like patents. Besides injunction, monetary compensation is recoverable from the proprietor of the design, either as contract debt or damages. So that's a bit about industrial designs. The, the last bit that I wanted to cover before I move into some uh, tips and some things that you know I, I want to probably convey to you as an organization who's who's into operations or as a founder who's just started off and is, is probably trying to build in a team. Okay. So assignment of intellectual property, right? Now, what's an assignment of intellectual property, right? If somebody's developed something for you, for your organization, you have it assigned to your organization at a value, you value, so there's a valuation done and accordingly there's monetary compensation given against which the assignment of IP is done. For this, you should probably have an assignment agreement in place. Sometimes I've seen that uh, MSMEs, mid-sized companies do buy out the brand of another company, which is probably not doing that well and they just want to absorb it into their company. Now that, there, you have to have an assignment agree agreement in place. You can't just have a one page or letter. The simple reason that that IP belongs to you going forward. And hence you need to be adequately protected to ensure all the IP actually rightfully comes to you. And the fact that the person who's assigning it to you or the entity which is assigning it to you does whatever is required to be done to assign it to you completely. Tomorrow, in case you have to file anything with the authority to get it transferred to your name, the original owner, the, the, the rightful owner of that IEP should be willing to sign whatever is to be done to be able to get it transferred to your name name in the official records as well if it all is a registered uh, IP and you need to have a, a, a very comprehensive uh, IP assignment agreement other apart from that when you have a business transfer which, which happens from one entity to the other IP forms a very important part now you could probably transfer everything but for an IP more often than not, we have seen an IP assignment agreement in place where you have the parties executing and agreeing to the terms on which the assignment will happen, the monetary compensation at which the assignment will take place, how the money will flow out, how the IP will be transferred, all of it being adequately captured in the agreement. And also when you are being funded, this uh, document does play a very important role. And hence, assignment of IPR is a very important aspect that one should keep in mind. Moving on to co-ownership of intellectual property rights. Now here, what I want to uh, probably uh, uh, draw your attention to is that there is a possibility that uh, an IP that you develop or, uh, uh, you know, uh, in case you intend to uh, enter into a JV with another uh, entity, in, in some jurisdiction or in India or multiple jurisdiction. What happens is each party gets in something into the JV. And it may so happen that during the course of the, the, the functioning of the JV, there could be some IP that may be developed. More so what happens is this IP is, 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 uh, is owned jointly by the JV partners. That's the concept of co-ownership. Now, what happens in a co-ownership? The fact that neither party can do anything with that particular IP without the other party's consent. While it's a given fact because it's co-ownership. However, you need to have it in writing so that it is, it, it is very well clear that, uh, that neither of them can do without the, the, without the consent of the other. So co-ownership as a concept is is not uh, uh, is not uh, very seen very not very common however it's important to note that this is a concept which does exist in the market and if at all you do come across that in case that there, there comes a point where you have to uh, co-own an ip with another entity or a person 
then these terms need to be kept in mind. How the IP is going to be transferred in case the IP has to be sold off tomorrow, the liquidity which comes in will have to be uh, a pro uh, proportionately distributed between the parties. All of that gets covered in a co in the arrangement which is which which governs the co ownership of IPR. Okay, that's about these two concepts. Now there are a couple of things that you can do beyond. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, registering yourself under or making an application to register your mark, your work, your, 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 your inventions under the regulation that we just discussed. That is, when you have an organization, you have an organization where you have employees, you have consultants, you have third party vendors whom you engage, you should always have an IP protection provision in your contract. You have to remember that these are ways and means in which you can protect your IP, right? Because tomorrow, in case you want to make a claim against your employer, your consultant, your, 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 you know, your third party vendor, in case you think they are responsible to be infringing your IP, then yes, you need to be able, you need to have a recourse. You will have a recourse through this agreement that you execute with them. And hence, it's very important for you to have uh, uh, appropriate provisions in your contract, which not only takes care of, uh, uh, you know, uh, protection from uh, disclosure of any uh, confidential information, but yes, uh, uh, protection from infringing your IP. You may not really uh, identify your IP in the contract. You can just make a definition, a clear cut definition of what the IP would uh, would really mean, and that the other party is bound by the IP obligations. And also, you could take appropriate indemnity indemnification uh, from the vendor, employee, consultants, uh, as the case may be. So you should also. It's not just about you doing an act of making an application to register your IP, but also about adequately protecting yourself by way of having uh, having the same in your contract that is one the other bit is and also this gives a, a quite a lot of comfort to investors in case you're looking for funding so that's one bit the other thing is in case um, you are uh, still at a very nascent stage in your business and you do enter into a co-founders agreement. Your co-founders agreement should certainly, between the co-founders, it needs to be agreed that the IP, whatever they have developed or they will develop tomorrow, will be owned by the company alone, right? There, the, the, the concept of co-ownership doesn't come in because it doesn't work. And hence, it is, uh, it is, it is, it is beneficial that you you between co-founders agree that the IP will at all times belong to the company. And also the fact that once, of course, you make an application, you make an application uh, in the name of the company, right? That's, that's uh, you know, that's a bit about how you could probably take care of it uh, from, a, from a contact perspective. Also, you know, uh, in, case, in case you have filed it or you have already filed it before coming to the session, I don't know, you are probably facing any kind of opposition uh, from uh, opposite party and they've raised the claim and said, you know, that probably this will not work out. They filed the necessary proceedings with the registry. Remember that you have to ensure that you are filing your counter within a timeline because what happens is that in case you don't do that, then you lose your right to file your counter. And then it is at the discretion of the registry to really accept your counter or not. And so it's very important for you to uh, uh, understand the timelines and accordingly uh, live up to it, right? So here is to conclude what we uh, dealt with today. The first thing that you need to do if you've not already done is to uh, you know, if you are a founder, then yes, you need to identify the startup that you want to really uh, establish, or if you've already established, then the kind of the, the sector that you are operating in. Okay. Once you've done that, then you identify the 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 uh, the IP around your business, the product, the services that you are intending to render, or you are rendering today. And basis what we discussed today. The broad heads, trademark, copyright, patent, designs. Which category does it fall in? 
you need to identify that okay and thereafter you need to get in touch with your with your consultant it could be an ipr professional your counsel whoever it is to get your ip registered it's 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 it involves cost yes however it is good in the longer run for you and your business and of course you have to make your uh, applications you have to you have to do the requisite filings with the registry in order to get your uh, ip registered so that's a bit about that's my take on uh, uh, intellectual property uh, rights and uh, and the ways and means in which you can take uh, appropriate measures to protect your ip and uh, and it's not just uh, restrictive to uh, to 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 make a statutory filings but also in your contracts in your day to day business how can you ensure that you can protect your ip so that's all about ip in case anybody has any question i'll be happy to take it Roni, there's one question in the Q and A tab. If you can take that. Yes, I can. Can I have X Y Z Private Limited on paper and have A B C as the brand name, which is trademarked, branded, owned by X Y Z Private Limited? Yes, you can. You can. That's a very common uh, thing that uh, that we see because the company. uh name uh, may or may not be available from uh, from the roc perspective or you may just probably come up with a brand name which is more eye catchy and you know probably attract uh, uh, the audience but and the registry may accept it but the roc is not so it's very, it's a very common practice to have this it's fine you can do it and even when you uh, go in for funding if at all the investors will not have a problem with it till the time the brand under which you are promoting and selling your products is adequately protected and the brand is recognized it's all good uh, participants any more questions you can post it in the q and a tab or uh, even in the chat so i'll give you an example while you know participants take a, take their time to you know pose their questions there is a matter which i was uh, in which came to us and uh, you know they filed their uh, applications to register their trademark before uh, covid or way before covid actually and uh, they, uh, you know they filed it the registrar did not really uh, uh, have uh, did not really have that many comments on the application and the mark and unfortunately they happened to be in the service industry and had like multiple logos uh, on which they filed an application it involves cost you know because if you are uh, you know it, it it involves government fee as well as a professional fee because whichever person that you go to any consultant that they go to you will always have a professional fee and a government fee now in case you are an msme you get uh, a subsidy of 50% uh, uh, 50% on the government fee now they made they made 10 applications i'm not joking 10 applications different different variations of their brand name their tagline their logo all of that was done and the registry didn't really the registrar didn't have that much of an issue they it got they got it published the registrar got it published now after you publish it there are it's open for any kind of any opposition uh, for four months and if there are no claims raised by any opposite party within those four months it's deemed to be registered earlier you used to get the certificate of registration physical certificates now it's no longer like like that you get a online a uh, e certificate now the four months started before just before covid it started actually or during covid it started and there was an opposition which uh, opposite party who raised the claim saying that you know what this uh, this is fairly similar to what we have and
and uh, it was COVID times and uh, the registrar uh, obviously was quite lacked because uh, it was, everything was shut, right? Now, our, my client actually went ahead and filed a reply to the other side, but did not file a counter reply with the registry. Now, now, now what is happening is once things have opened up, we really want to file the counter, but we can't file it because the time has lapsed. And there are chances that the applications, those eight to 10 applications which have been filed by my client can be abandoned. So that's the extent to which you, you and your counsels, your, your, whoever you expert that you go to, have to be mindful of the timelines which have been stipulated under the act. Because if you don't do that, then there are chances that you lose out on the money, your time, your effort, and it's not really good for you and the company. So bear that in mind when you uh, carry out any kind of uh, if, if you take out any kind of applications to register your IP. That's one example that I really want to mention it today, highlight it because it's important for you guys to know. I thought you guys should, should know that. I, I think there's some question in the tab. There's yeah. one question in the q and tab. Yeah. Can I trademark some name which someone has copied after three to four years of our use it's company name made it's company name made after private limited to copyright three can i trademark some name which someone has copied after three to four years of our use yeah, so here the concept of prior usage comes in, right? So even if you still haven't, uh, uh, if, you, if you still haven't made an application to, uh, to register your mark, the fact that you have a prior usage, uh, uh, if you apply the prior usage principle and you have that right, then yes, you can certainly file it. That's not a problem at all. Although the second line, I didn't really get it, but I think the first question I got it pretty clear. So yeah, you can do that. You could probably uh, offline tell me your details and probably I can uh, let you know more on it. What is a quick way to know whether I'm infringing the patent to someone else unknowingly? Yeah, you will have to, uh, you'll have to engage a patent uh, counsel, uh, agent or whatever lawyer that you go to, IP lawyer, you will have to get them on board. So what we do is that uh, we, we collect, obviously, because it's proprietary to you and no, it's, it's, it must be a very niche technology process that you may have invented. And hence, there is an NDA which is executed with, uh, with, 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 with an attorney, between the attorney and uh, the person who wants to get it checked. And you have to share all your details pertaining to the invention with your counsel and the counsel will then do a diligence on uh, and breaking it down to see that whether this is similar to anything in the market. You really cannot do it on your own because there's a questionnaire as well which you'll have to fill up. The idea is they'll break down the process to us to ensure that there is no similarity in any point in time or is there something which makes you uh, stand out from what is already there in the market. What's your USP? You may say it out loud, but your patent counsel will surely have to begin to uh, evaluate the same. I hope that answers your question. Any uh, further questions, participants? In case you do uh, get any questions, Nirmal, uh, offline, yeah. uh, do feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'll be happy to take them up. Just one more question Are patent registrations global? No. No, it is not. You'll have to go under. Uh, uh, one, you'll have to identify the jurisdiction under which you really want to uh, patent 
your technology and post which you will have to uh, you'll have to figure it out. you have to figure out the process that's how it works Thanks, Rohini. I guess uh, there are no more questions. If any of the participants have any specific questions to Rohini, please uh, share that with the Thai secretary. It will take it up. Uh, we'll share it with uh, Rohini and her team too uh, for inputs. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Rohini. Uh, very insightful session. In fact, uh, patent and trademark uh, no, are very uh, critical aspects uh, during the growth stage, unless okay. when you are working with innovative products. So, very important uh, session. Uh, I'm sure we can uh, you know, collaborate to do similar programs in future too, uh, sure. useful for the startup ecosystem. Uh, just to thank all the participants who uh, came in late today, you know, it's an evening uh, and now uh, in Kerala especially, we have uh, restarted uh, most of the businesses and even public transportation is back on track. So uh, I'm sure most of us are you know, busy with our day-to-day -day activities. So yeah. thanks for participating. Uh, I look forward to your participation again next week when we organize a similar session during the week. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Rohini. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank and you, Nirmal. Thank you for having me on board. And thank you, participants, for uh, the questions posted. And uh, thank you for your patience. In case you do have any uh, further questions, feel free to reach out to Nirmal and his team. And I'll be happy to take it up. Thank you very much for your time. Bye, guys. Sure. Thank you. Good evening.